Were you out dancing in the rain? Is that what happened? No, I made the very foolish mistake of going to April 5th. Uh, you know, oh, uh, everybody brain knows extended the tax return time. Uh, so you didn't have to have your tax forms mailed off on April 15th. But apparently every single person in Dallas that was headed to the post office today did not get the memo because I had to wait in line for what seemed like over an hour. Uh, it was it was pretty rough, but, you know, what can you do? Uh, it, it's, it's been raining outside. We needed the rain, uh, but because it's also been hot in Dallas, it's been in the 80s almost every day. Now we have humidity, so I step out in the rain and, and I'm all, you know, I've got, my hair looks like it's got schmutz in it or something, but no, it's just, it's just humidity. So I need a haircut. I need another COVID cut. I've been cutting my own hair, Devin. <laughs> Are you using a Floby? No, I just use, I have a pair of like uh, clippers that I use to trim my beard, but I've just been using that to cut my hair and I've kind of gotten pretty good at it. <laughs> I never thought I never thought that would be a skill that I would have to learn, but yeah, there you go. You really turning in you are really turning into an elderly Jewish man. You know this, I am, right? I am, yes. Aha! Aha! <laughs> Kids, that's Mark Walters. That guy over there is Devin Pike. Thank you very much for watching the Big Film Show. It is our weekly wrap party where we give you the week in entertainment news as as much as it is fit to jump in and uh, throw it online. We are live every single Thursday night on Facebook and Twitch, so you can uh, follow those channels on Big Film Show, all on both of those. You can also subscribe to the podcast for the Big Film Show, wherever your podcast entertainment comes into your life, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just search for The Big Film Show. As always, we want you to be a part of the rap party. That's why we have an email address. It is hey at bigfilmshow.com. Later on this afternoon, evening, morning, whatever it is, time is an abstract concept, we're going to be joined by the great Jasmine Dudley. She of Riot Games out in Los Angeles. We're going to get her perspective on the coming out of the darkness that is COVID-19 in one of the epicenters of the outbreak in America and what it's like working in the entertainment industry in the middle of this noise. Yeah, I first got to know Jasmine uh, from her website, Pretty Brown and Nerdy, and she is awesome. Like she has, she has shared a stage with us to debate Star Wars. Uh, I've hung out with her at San Diego Comic-Con. She is great. I used to bump into her all the time here at screenings in Dallas. And uh, sadly, I'm very happy for her that she got the job that she got because I know that she was really, you know, going after that. But it does kind of suck that we don't really get to bump into her day to day anymore. Uh, so it's going to be great to have her here on the show so we can catch up a little bit and find out what she's been up to. Uh, and I'm telling you, she's awesome. You guys need to totally check her out. We'll, we'll throw out all the links and everything that you guys need to follow. But she is uh, she is truly one of the best of, of our group of friends that we have that kind of all work in the same sort of fields. And speaking of her, there's How she does it is. feel to have your lot your, yourself <laughs> lauded before we even get you into the room? Oh, you know, I mean, thank you. I love listening to people rave about me. Thank you. <laughs> Jasmine, we have missed you so much. And Hello. I'm, we're so very happy for you that you've got the job that you've got, but it, it really sucks not having you here because, you know, well, not that we would have been able to bump into you for the last year anyway, because of COVID, but still not being able to see you at screenings and stuff like that. Uh, it, it, we've we've missed you, so it's wonderful to have you join us on the show. I'm happy to be here, and sorry I'm fashionably late. Um, not it's at been all. A, no, quite fine. a busy day, but um, yeah, I honestly I miss everyone too. Um, you know, LA is great, but I mean, it's better with friends and people that I know. Um, so yeah, I definitely miss that experience a lot, but I'm definitely enjoying my time here. Um, I feel super motivated being here, uh, but things have been busy. I'm not even gonna lie. <laughs> so for tell us what you actually do at Riot Games, because well, I'm tell, curious. Wait, wait, wait a second, Devin, let's give her a proper introduction. Ladies oh, and gentlemen. Of course, sure, Dad sure. Dudley, our wonderful friend from Pretty Brown and Nerdy, also uh, working at Riot Games. She was formerly in Dallas, based in Dallas, which is where we got to know her. 
and now she's uh, working out in LA. She's she's living the good life in LA. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but we're very honored to have her join us on the show. So there you go, Devin, take it over. Well, I was just going to say that uh, what you see behind Jasmine is the entire apartment that she has. So <laughs> that, <laughs> that, <laughs> it, it costs thirty five hundred dollars, and it's actually part of somebody else's apartment. Right. So you know, this is yeah, this is like an hundred k apartment. You know, I only have my bed or my bed and. My closet right here, it could double as a bathroom, take your pick, you know, <laughs> like, no, and in all honesty, it's a pretty good apartment. This is my bedroom, but obviously, as you can see, it's not decorated yet at all, like still very desolate and white walls, but um, everything else outside of that is is nice and pretty. <laughs> I, would, I would imagine that moving out there is already scary enough, but what is it like apartment shopping in LA? I mean, like compared to like say Dallas or some other place, you know, that would be more easy to navigate. You know, like Dallas honestly is easier um, and more is offered in Dallas. I find uh, here, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, your standards are, are too high. It's going to take too long for you to find anything. Because I was like, okay, first off, I want a fridge and I need <laughs> a, and like, I don't, I don't know what it is with like apartments here, but like some of them don't come with refrigerators. And I'm just like, I have to buy my own refrigerator. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and you got to schlep it into your joint too. I mean, right. good God. Yeah. And then like, there's no central AC in a lot I of apartments. I just about to ask that. Yeah. Because most yeah. apartments out there, they don't bother putting it in there because it's so expensive. So Yeah. They don't update them. Some of them are really old and like they'll remodel them, but not put central heating or like air in them. Yeah. Um, and that's like also a thing with some houses too, but I'm like, no, you're not going to charge me like eighteen ninety five in rent or something, and I'm not going to have a refrigerator or AC. Uh uh. So, um, oh it was definitely a lot of shopping around. I remember I was I looked ahead of time, so I started looking like before I even got my job offer. Um, and I'm really happy that I did that because I did have some lined up um in advance. But yeah, uh, some of the apartments I saw were definitely I'm just like, are you for real? Like. <laughs> what was one? <laughs> what what was this one studio apartment that I saw where it was like it was a studio apartment, and then it was like the it was both the living room and the bedroom, and then a little corner had like an oven, and that was it. <laughs> and I was and then a bathroom, and then I was like, "Where's the rest of the kitchen?" <laughs> it was like <laughs> just a countertop and a stove, and I was like, I saw the rent that they were charging, and I'm like wow y'all are out of your minds but um i ended up finding a pretty good area and also the thing about la is like you could be on a nice street one second and then like a raggedy area the next so um definitely um you know flying out a week uh for a week to just really see the apartments in person definitely helped um and I ended up surprisingly selecting the first one that i looked at um of course i looked at the others before i put my application in but Uh oh, did we lose her? Oh, she's pointing at me. I, oh, Jazzy. Oh, am I coming back? Oh, okay, no, 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 there you are. Yay. Back. Back. I'll tell I was you like, what. I deal with this with Mark all the damn time, so it's not yeah, surprising usually, that I see it from you, too. Me freezing. I would be like going, ah. And then let like, let like me turn off Wi Fi on everything. So no, that's that okay. You're doing great. You're doing it. great. I am curious since you've been out in LA, because you and I used to bump into each other all the time in the screenings. Mm -hmm. Do you still go to screenings out in LA and, and, or, or like, what is your, it also, this kind of is tangentially connected to one of our news stories that we're going to cover tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your movie theater of choice in the LA area? You know, I wish I knew it. I don't know yet because I haven't really been outside. Um, I just got my second dose of my vax of the COVID vaccine. So, you know, in two weeks, maybe that'll change. And now I'll finally feel comfortable to go to a movie theater. Mm -hmm. But um, unfortunately, the ones of my interest, and I'm sure everybody knows, has just closed um, or announced that it's closing the arch light. So it's yeah. just like, yeah, that's very sad because I was looking forward to going to that theater because, um, you know, I hear a lot of good things about it. But we also have an Alamo Draft House here, though. Um, so I can't wait to go to the Alamo Draft House here and see what that's like. Um, and I know there's like a Cinemark XD, like maybe 15 minutes away from me. Um, 
but I haven't checked it out. I kind of uh, teeter on like the edge of, mm, I'm not sure. Cause I, I really thrive on like that nice movie theater experience. Cause I'm spoiled by Alamo draft house. So yeah. I'm just like, if it doesn't have like those quirks or like things that it offers, I typically don't, you know, put it on my list of theaters to attend. But yeah, that's the one thing I'm hoping um, I'll be able to do now that I'm fully vaccinated and bougie, you know, I can, Finally, go out into the world now, and, and I, we're, we're all we're all three fully vaccinated. We're all three. Hey. Vaccinated. Are you House <laughs> Pfizer or House Moderna? Pfizer. <laughs> yes. yes, we're yeah. all three Pfizer. That's great. Yeah, I it's really going to be sharks and jets when we're on opposite sides of the street. Moderna, huh? Right. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just got my second dose on Tuesday, and I'm I'm very happy about it. So congratulations on that. That's great. Yeah, we've been talking about Alamo and uh, you know their plans are you know to reopen and whatnot. So we're very excited about that. But um, yeah, it's been it's been such a weird time when it comes to movie theaters and stuff like that. By the way, Jasmine, I just want to apologize for the creepy doppelganger of Devin that is sitting to his left. Why does that uh, creep you out really, so much? Why? That, and I love how you both have your invincible cutouts back there. <laughs> really like, do. We nice. Do both have our invincible cutouts. But that, <laughs> but that doppelganger cutout of him is completely inexcusable, and I have had a problem with it ever since. Kieran has no nice problem with it whatsoever. <laughs> cat cam though so that makes up for it we yeah, have cat cam cat action cam. going on um but yeah before we before we launch yeah. into the uh news jasmine tell us what you do over at riot games yes. oh yeah so um i work at riot games in game production primarily on the team fight tactics team um where i just you know i produce stuff uh make things happen for people and um i work closely with the store content uh integrating content uh within the game so um it can be a stressful job uh it's stressful for me right now because i'm just you know getting the hang of things um we are uh launching our newest set set five reckoning soon um so that's going to be exciting for all you team fight tactics players um but it's my first like big project that I'm working on. So, um, you know, things are, are kind of heat right now, but I'm learning so much um, at the studio and there's a lot of amazing people that I work with every day. So I can't wait till um, I can actually see our sick, insane campus because that'll be fun. Um, it's huge, it's huge. Uh, we have our own um, cafeteria our own coffee shop that is themed after one of uh, the lands in our game uh, from the world of Runeterra called Bilgewater. So you can go into Bilgewater and get your own like coffee or drink or whatever. Um, and we have our cafeteria noms where you can grab some food in between work. Uh, we have PC bongs, which are kind of like in Korea, PC bongs are like internet cafes of sort where you can go into like the PC bong rooms and like play a game of League or, you know, Rune Legends of Runeterra or whatever you want to play. So, um, you know, it's a pretty cool campus. I, I want to experience it so bad. <laughs> 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 Is there, have, have they figured out when uh, people are going to be able to start uh, coming back into the office on a normal basis? Mm, that's a good question. We There's been conversations surrounding it now that a lot of people are getting vaccinated um, and things are reopening in L.A., but I think like once we're in yellow tier, then like a lot of companies will start talking about like bringing people back in waves, which I'm sure they'll probably do. Um, I'm not sure I'll probably get priority because um, I'm fairly new and I don't even have like an area that they could put me. <laughs> um, so I'm assuming they'll prioritize like, you know, important uh, departments or crucial departments that they need to house first before anything. Um, but yeah, that, that conversation has definitely started uh, in the city as like what we'll do when things reopen, which I think right now the mayor has plans. I think they're saying, will be fully reopened if everything goes smoothly June 15th. Okay. That's all. Well, um, we want you to stick around and because a lot of the stories I, I want to get your take on as well because I'm I, over half of them I'm sure you've got. And honestly, if you've got to throw an elbow and tell Walters to shut up or even me, just, just say, hey, remember me <laughs> down here? So, um, and, or, and you had mentioned the art. something you want to add. Just, oh, just yeah. like, raise, your, raise your hand because we definitely want to hear you. That's what opinion. I meant, Mark. They, wait, 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 stay on the other <laughs> Hey, the, Devin, the, 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 shut the, up. <laughs> <laughs> I miss this. <laughs> and, and we missed you. So you mentioned the Arc Light, and Mark has our lead story, which is D23. 
dealing with the arc light in the cinema dome. Cinema yeah, dome. You know, it's it's been it's been a really tough time for movie theaters. Obviously, we've talked about this a lot on the show already, but uh, now we got some particularly depressing news because the arc light cinemas are in fact closing, and uh, this is. Um, People in the Dallas, Texas area may not really identify with this as much, but if you've ever been out in LA, uh, ArcLight Cinemas, it, it's kind of like the the cinema of choice, I mean, basically for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, you know, ArcLight and Pacific Theaters are remaining closed after shutting down due to, you know, the pandemic. And Pacific Theaters st announced on Monday in a statement that despite a huge effort that exhausted all potential options, the company does not have a viable way forward. Uh, I got to be honest, I'm kind of surprised that we're just now hearing this with some of these movie theaters because I think a lot of us expected to hear this summer of last year. But I think a lot of these theaters were, were doing everything they could to try to hold on and hope that maybe things would get better. Um, our buddy uh, Knives Out director Ryan Johnson even weighed in on this and I think he echoed a lot of a lot of what we're, some of us are feeling, which is he says, "Well, this sucks." Every single person who worked at the ArcLight loved the movies, and you felt it. Sending love to every usher, manager, and projectionist who rocked that blue shirt and made it such a special place. Um, Mindy Kaling even uh, posted and said, "Save the ArcLight." Uh, but you know, it, there's been a lot of like celebrity kind of uh, you know weigh-ins. Uh, James Gunn. Uh, shared his, you know, thoughts on it and whatnot. It's, it's just, uh, it's one of those depressing announcements that I think a lot of us thought, you know, would be inevitable. But at the same time, it is, you know, really depressing having to hear it. Uh, to some people, it's, it's really devastating. And so I don't know what this means for the future of uh, Los Angeles movie-going experiences. But it's, it's, this is a big deal for a lot of people. This would be kind of like us losing. Well, it would be like us losing all of our Alamo draft houses that we've come to know and love because we now have so many of them here, but it would be like that out in LA. And so it's just really sad. It's sad news. And, you know, I particularly was depressed because I always wanted to go to the Cinerama because it's such a historic, you know, movie theater. And, you know, you see it. I mean, it just recently was seen in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, you know, there's so many things that I, you know, going out to like the Dome or the Arclight Hollywood or the Americana, those different theaters, it's, it's just a really painful announcement, I think, for a lot of people. And um, and Jasmine, like we were talking just a second ago, you know, you haven't really had a chance to kind of take in those Los Angeles movie theater experiences, but I imagine you probably felt the same way. Like looking, like right now, Devin's got the picture up of the Cinerama Dome. Uh, you look at that and you just immediately have this overwhelming sense of nostalgia and like this is this is movies this is la yeah hollywood yeah so, for terrible. sure yeah i mean for sure um i always heard about arc light and like i know there's all there was a lot of screenings and like events that would happen there as well um where people would you know uh, directors would screen their movies and they have q and a's and things like that so um that was something that i was really excited about you know moving here is to experience that um and to hear it's closing is like very sad um i feel like i'm definitely missing out on the true like film lovers experience like living in the epicenter of like film and entertainment um because a lot of these places haven't been able to survive during the pandemic um there was even talk of like trying to push to get these listed as like historical landmarks or something to try to like save them. And rightfully so. Um, I think that's something that should definitely happen or should be pursued before, you know, they close because I feel like it's surprising that uh, at this point they're not. Um, I would think that they should be. And, you know, even people were like, oh, well, why don't like these movie directors or these entertainment companies like come in and like try to save it? And well, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, I that, really that don't could, that, could, that could still happen, actually. Yeah. So there's three there's three things that could happen at this point. We don't know who Arclight and their uh, parent company, um, Pacific Theaters, we don't know who they actually spoke to in their efforts to try to save the arc lights and the yeah. Cinerama domes. Cinerama domes also in us. Uh, there's another one in Seattle. And I didn't realize that until um, when we were researching for the story is that there's actually a Cinerama dome in, in Seattle as well. So there's three paths forward. Either a studio buys it, such as what uh, Disney did with the El Capitan, which is across the street from the Kodak Theater. 
I'm sorry, uh, not the Kodak Theater, the um, uh, Man's Chinese Theater. Yeah. Uh, you got the El Capitan, which they, they have all the Disney events there at the El Capitan. There's, a, there's another studio who could come in and uh, purchase it. Uh, maybe it's Sony, maybe it is... Well, God, are there any studios left after those two? Fox. Um, <laughs> well, I was thinking... Well, that's Disney. Thinking, <laughs> yeah, thinking or, yeah. The, oh, yeah, you're right, it dome. is now. <laughs> I was thinking because of the dome that maybe like Universal could look at it, but Universal's already got Universal Studios in Hollywood, so it would be kind of weird for them to also own a movie theater. But I, I, I would love it if somebody did that. I would also love it if maybe just, I mean, you know, Quentin Tarantino could buy that thing out and keep it going, you know? I mean, there there's plenty of people out there that have the money, have the means to be able to do it. So hopefully- And that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, you know, there's, the, this is LA for crying out loud, you know, like, it's like everyone that's like saying, oh, so sad, you know, like, okay, save it. <laughs> you can, you can do it. <laughs> well, Tarantino so, has the new, Tarantino has, a, has an ownership stake in the new Beverly. So I'm not mm. sure if he'd want to pitch in on the arc light, but then again, yeah. I, who knows how much money he's made off of Pulp Fiction and uh, Django Unchained over the years. Yeah. So um, there's well, those. Was, which kind of feeds directly into the next story, which is how people feel about the safe quality or, or the safetiness of going back to the movie theater. And, and maybe that's part of the reason why nobody's stepping in to save it right about now. Yeah. True. And, and we still don't know what the uh, environment is going to be because you're going to have this for the foreseeable future. Because even though the three of us and a lot of our friends and people who are in the industry have gotten their first and second vaccine shots, we're all sitting there saying, okay, now we're vaccinated. Now we can go to the movies. And, and Mark and I are talking about going to see Godzilla vs. Kong in a theater. But even still, doctors are saying that even though you may be 100% vaccinated, the choice uh, the choice for people who aren't vaccinated to go in, it still presents a, an infection risk because it's not a magic shield that keeps you, um, keeps you safe. So uh, there was a quote on CNN from Crystal Pollitt, who is an assistant professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health. She says, before entering any type of theater, it's important to also consider what the background rates of disease are within your community and also the contribution of the variants that might be circulating. What that means is how, I mean, are is your town, is your city seeing another spike? Because across the country, we're in a fourth wave of infection right now. So, and, and that's true for Texas. It's definitely true for California. It's true for New York. And a lot of the Midwest is seeing it as well. So the question remains, how safe is it? And we all want to go to Alamo. We all want their truffle popcorn. We love the movie Snacks. But any food contains an infection risk as well because you're removing your mask and you're eating food that has that might have been exposed to and a variant of COVID-19. So at that point, you're looking at it and saying, is it safe enough for you and me and my family to go into a theater and see it? And the answer from the, these epidemiologists is, we wouldn't recommend it. And I yeah. hate saying that because we need movies. We need to get out of our house. We need to see Godzilla versus Kong on a big screen. We need to see F9 on a big screen. Do, we do need we, to see do we really the Dewey though. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that I need a big dumb movie to take my brain out of my head and sit in the seat next to me and you know as long as I can you know get a Clorox wipe and put the seat down and make sure that it's all safe and whatnot because put my brain back in it's fine I read this story and um, really within five hours of reading it three of uh, three of the listeners of the big film show said are you guys going to discuss this because you've been beating the drum for seeing movies in a theater again and they're all correct is that this gives me pause again so how you safe know. is too safe how safe is not safe enough you know i do definitely miss those cookie shakes from alamo draft house so. oh my god <laughs> you know that that's one thing oof uh you just saying that i'm hungry <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah I never, you know i never thought i would miss alamo draft house food but boy am i missing it right about now right <laughs> 
But yeah. like, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, I think even being vaccinated, you know, like if you would ask me, like, do I feel completely like sure about returning to the theater? And, you know, I'm not quite sure yet. And I think Shiva agrees since she just walked up while I'm saying that. Oh, but, um, Shiva. <laughs> Shiva. 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 Okay. I know, right? Dog cam. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just sad. And I know, like, theaters have been trying to, like, get around this and try to, like, bring revenue. Whether that's trying to even cater to gamers, you know? They're like, oh, come rent a theater and, and play, like, you know, your Xbox or PlayStation. Like, have a game night with your friends on the big screen. Um, even, like, just renting private theaters to watch movies that way. Like, they've really, try they've really been trying to come up with like creative ways to bring money into the door because it's so hard right now. Like yeah. nobody's going to the theaters. And then you have like with HBO Max having all these films coming to HBO, which um, in my opinion, HBO Max is the best uh, bang for your buck right now because they're not charging a $30 premium to be able to watch a new movie like Disney Plus. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's just people are going to choose that option. They're like, oh, I can watch Kong and the safety of my home and not worry about infection. Yeah. Well, but it is, Kong it, is <laughs> it is important to note, though, because we I think we just covered this on last week's show. Or, yeah, I think we did talk about it, about how uh, Godzilla vs. Kong is now the highest grossing film to be released during the pandemic. It's earned something like, uh, oh, God, De Devin, do you remember the numbers? Well, right now it's sitting it's sitting at 85 mil before the uh the before its second weekend in release yeah is that, so is that it was US 60 revenue? mil prior, it was 60 mil in the in the I release was, weekend i was thinking i was thinking worldwide i can't remember i think it was 390 worldwide which is not enormously great but it is like a sign that things are maybe starting to kind of return to a little bit of normal mm -hmm. and uh so i think that maybe the studios see that you know there is still a chance they can make money back on their films but you're right, we're not there yet. And this is the first film to actually surpass Tenet, which was last year's highest grossing film to be released during the pandemic. And it's funny because like what you were saying, Jasmine, I I broke the rule one time last year and I went and I saw Tenet on a big screen. It was opening weekend and I was one of nine people in the theater and it was depressing. It was just like, oh God, I like not only the safety side of it, like being uncomfortable going, but it was just kind of like, I don't want to see a movie like this. I don't want to yeah. see a movie with eight other people in the theater. I, that just feels weird. And it so put insult I, to injury because it was flipping Tenet. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then the movie sucked. But well, you know, at least anyway. had a banging soundtrack, you know, Ludwig it did. It did. doing his thing. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh, here's your Godzilla versus Kong numbers according to Box Office Mojo. Okay. 70 million domestic gross. Mm -hmm. 268.6 million international with for a worldwide take in one weekend or sorry one full week of 338 million dollars okay so i'm certain that warner's is just gaga over those numbers at this point well okay let's keep in mind the movie cost 160 million to make that doesn't include marketing dollars so usually a film has to make three times its budget for them to consider it even successful uh not much less a hit um, so they still have a ways to go, but it's rocking and rolling. And I think that's the point is that at least it shows us that maybe there is a chance that movies could start to be coming back a little bit. I think we've probably seen the end of $200 million blockbusters for a bit. I don't think we're going to see, I like fast nine. The only reason we're getting that now is because it's been delayed for two years. I don't think we're going to see a lot more movies like that for at least a couple of years because I think the studios are going to start being really careful how they spend their money. But I agree with Jasmine. It's like you look at HBO Max and, you know, they're doing day and date release. You can watch it on streaming or you can watch it in a movie theater. The choice is yours. And the movie is still making money in the movie theater and HBO Max is making a lot of money. So it kind of begs the question, hey, Disney, why are you zapping us for $30 on a film just because we want to watch it at home and not go out? Like, isn't there some kind of happy medium in there that you could, you know, come to some sort of an agreement you could come to with us that doesn't make us feel like we're getting ripped off? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're already paying a lot for Disney Plus anyway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think and here's, here's the other thing that I'm, I'm really curious to know if we're ever going to know the answer to this. But 
when Warner's announced that they were going to do these day and date releases and then Netflix was doing it and then Amazon was doing it, we heard rumors that were never substantiated that it was going to be a certain amount of kickback to the movie studio itself of the order of 100 million, 150 million to supplant the money that it was going to lose by not being solely in the theater for a 30 or 60 day exclusive window like you have it normally. So I wonder if that gross number also has a hidden component because everybody knows that studio math is the worst math. It's worse than anything you'll find on any standardized test that your kid has to take in high school. But is that number actually sitting at 500 million coming from the HBO Max broadcast side going over to the Warner Brothers studio side? And, and I wonder if we're ever going to know that answer. And add to that that Godzilla vs. Kong is a co-production of Warner Brothers and Legendary Pictures. So how do they divvy that up even further? Like how much are you cutting that pie up and who's actually getting the largest percentage of it? That's a very good question. Yeah. And we may never know the answer to that. Especially well, of course, I mean, none of the Harry Potter movies have made money, by the way. <laughs> yeah. According to the studio, none of the Harry Potter movies, they're still they're still trying to scrape coins out of their couch to pay for the Deathly Hallows Part 2. It's just sad. It's just sad. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of news that is not, not so sad, uh, the great Mark Hamill is joining a new film that uh, this... This could go either way. I don't know what to think about this. I'm a big fan of Burt Kreischer, and I love his stand-up comedy routine about the machine. I think it's absolutely hilarious. If you've never seen it, you can find it in its entirety on YouTube. It is absolutely worth uh, looking it up. Just look up the machine, Burt Kreischer. That's K-R-E-I-S-C-H-E-R. Uh, it's all about his time being in Russia and dealing with the Russian mafia. It's, it's one of those stories that when you hear it, you think, wow, that sounds almost unbelievable, but it's so crazy, it has to be true. And so he has told the story countless times. It's it's become legendary, not just within the realm of stand-up comedy, but you know, people kind of sharing it with their friends and whatnot. Well, now they're making a movie over it, and uh, Mark Hamill is joining the cast and actually announced on his Twitter that he was <laughs> flying over to uh what was it germany right he's flying into right. uh, yeah and he's uh getting ready to film and i was happy to kind of see this because it is one of those things that you think about especially now i was curious like when these guys go to film movies are they following any kind of procedures you know to be safe and whatnot he actually is quarantining for two weeks before they start shooting and i was kind of happy to hear that so um it should be interesting this is going to be directed by uh, Kean Peel and Keanu director Peter Atencio, uh, and he's going to take care of the film. And and so, uh, you know, he's real good at kind of that 1990s action movie sort of motif and whatnot. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what role Mark Hamill plays. I'm guessing Mark Hamill's going to be a bad guy. Uh, um, think... Actually, we 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 know what he's going to be playing. He's actually playing Bert's father, who oh, plays very heavily into the story because. It, I, I, I don't want to give away the entire thing if you've never seen the uh, routine because it's a it's a good 10, 12, 15 minute routine. But there is a run in with the Russian mafia that Bert has, and eventually his father is kidnapped by the Russian mafia. And Hamill is going to be playing Bert's father, and Bert's going to be playing himself in the film. Well, that's even Listen, better. Uh, that's going to be very good. <laughs> it's just in case you're curious just how popular this is, the routine that is on YouTube has been viewed over 85 million times. So if you're wow. sitting there saying to yourself, why would anybody want to see a movie about this? Well, just look at the numbers and there's your answer. So I can't wait to see it. I'm so happy that Mark Hamill is like doing movies again. I just think it's so awesome that he's like back out there working. Because, I mean, he went through a good, what was it, like 30-year period where he was just doing voiceover. Mm -hmm. And now, all of a sudden, he's, like, back on the big screen. I think it's great. I remember, because uh, yeah. I was actually uh, flipping around on cable as, as we were getting ready to do the show. And Kingsman, the Gold, Golden Circle. Uh, no, sorry, the first one. Uh, the... Uh, uh, Kingsman the Secret Service yeah. was on yeah. and he plays a small role at the front of the film and has like a very tiny role in the middle of it as well and it reminded me 
of just how fun it is to see him on screen again. You know what's interesting about that? The reason that he got that role, if you ever read the comic book, The Secret Service, that that movie is based off of, which is considerably different from what they ended up doing in the movie, but in the first issue, uh, the rescue mission in the first issue is that Mark Hamill, as Mark Hamill, has been <laughs> kidnapped and died because the mission goes bad. Like the mission gets screwed up and Mark Hamill dies. And so when they, you know, basically Mark Millar, who wrote The Secret Service and Kingsman The Secret Service, said, you know, well, we have to put, even if he's not playing himself, we still have to put Mark Hamill in the first movie. So I love the fact that, like, even though they couldn't necessarily honor the exact same story, they still figured out a way to work Mark Hamill into the first film. I thought that was really funny. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know how familiar you guys are with the great Tignataro. Awesome. She is, she's a phenomenal comedian, uh, a really solid actor. If you've been watching uh, Star Trek Discovery, she's had an engineering role in the last two seasons of that. So uh, flash forward to uh, Zack Snyder and his upcoming film on Netflix, Army of the Dead. We've covered that trailer. Um, it was one of the last trailers that we played on the big film show before people started getting pissed and started uh, hitting us with CODs. We're going to mm -hmm. take care of that. But... In the middle of the production, Chris D'Elia is whacked with uh, allegations of sexual misconduct towards his co-stars and towards um, other women. He is replaced, after the film is completely done shooting, with Tig Notara. And you're saying to yourself, we're in quarantine. They can't come back and reshoot everything that Chris D'Elia has done. Well, all they had to do was, oh, I don't know, put Tig Notaro in front of a green screen and body match everything that Chris D'Elia does. So instead of Chris D'Elia, we get Tig Notaro mm -hmm. being an absolute up. badass. Up. How about is that up. movie magic? Look at that movie magic right there. <laughs> you know what I love about that, though, is that it kind of speaks to, like, uh, like down the line, like you could do this with any actor, like any actor at it, this should be like a warning shot for any actor in Hollywood. Like, listen, either you like shape up or this is going to happen to you. We're going to replace you with someone better. Oh, you yeah. Know? And, and it's going to be so easy for us to do it because now all the days, well, all we have to do is just throw them on a green screen. So all you actors in Hollywood, you better keep your nose clean or this is going to happen to you. And I'm actually really happy about this because I love Tig Notaro. I think she's great. So I, I can't. I mean, they had to use Tig Notaro because Christopher Plummer has passed away and they couldn't hire him <laughs> to come in and do uh, this role. Um, but Jazz, I'm curious if, you, if you're in the same mindset that I am. I don't know. I mean, Mark brings up a really good point. It's almost like a very hardcore way to keep actors not only in line but maybe they you know maybe they get their pay renegotiated maybe their contract doesn't quite work maybe their performance isn't working they have to do stuff that they're not comfortable with i don't that's kind of a chilling effect for me i mean what they what they what they did with christy elias footage great awesome love tignataro but in a situation where it's not as cut and dried i wonder what you think if if that's going to be a chilling effect for the rest of hollywood um i think absolutely it would scare me as an actor to realize how replaceable i am if i you know mess up i don't know if i'm allowed to curse on here but like <laughs> you can say fuck up it's fine i was like if i fuck up you know like but i think um that should definitely change their perspective is like when you walk through the door don't be an asshole or don't think that you know you're hot shit because you'll be out of here in a second but also i think like it helps um you know with the amount of like flexibility some actors have to have because like if you think about lena Headey, for example from game of thrones when she was playing cersei she did not uh, do that scene, the walk of shame like scene, that was not her naked. Like that was a body double and they just like worked magic and like CG'd her face on her. So I think like 
that definitely um, creates more working opportunities for some actors because you can have a situation where they're like, hey, I'm not comfortable being fully nude or, you know, something instead of just saying, well, if you don't want to do it, you're done. I think with the newfound technology, there are ways to kind of work around that so you can still retain the talent and like everything is not a deal breaker if they don't want to like fully go there. Um, so I think it's interesting how like current tech is being used um, in different ways, especially like when it comes to like film and what is possible now. Um, so I don't think it's just in a case of like cancellation or like you're out of here if you like do something just completely terrible. Um, but I think it presents opportunities for, for others um, in cases where like they would have had to not accept a job because they didn't want to be like fully nude or, you know, whatever have you. So um, or they couldn't do a stunt, you know, like um, that that's just something else to think about. Yeah. So if you're keeping score, Mark is glass half full, I'm glass half empty, and Jasmine is balanced. So <laughs> if, if you're keeping score, that's basically how it works. Uh, what? What do you? How do you? Think of it? <laughs> all, I, all I know, all I know is this movie's cast has got a nice trade up. That's all I know. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, moving on, uh, we've got some more news. Uh, we're talking about. Uh, Kind of like what I guess you could say, like the big summer movies that are coming up. And we did mention this earlier in the show that uh, Fast Nine, which was actually supposed to come out two years ago, uh, and it got pushed back, not knowing that COVID was going to be a thing. They pushed it back once, and I'm sure they highly regretted that. And then they pushed it back again because of COVID, because they knew there was no way they could get proper theatrical distribution. So now there's a, we, we just saw a brand new trailer that dropped this week. Uh, this film sees the return of Justin Lin, who of course is the director that a lot of people feel like it kind of elevated the Fast franchise, the, or I'm sorry, as it's appropriately called, the Fast Saga. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not, that I'm seems not so kidding. pretentious to me. I know. Oh, the God. Fast Saga. <laughs> and, and, and I also love... I also love that he's talking about the future of the Fast Saga and saying that Fast Nine, not not only is Fast Nine not the last film, he's talking about Fast Eleven, which will supposedly end the franchise. So we got two more of these that oh we got to get God. through before we get finished with them. Um, but there's also <laughs> there's also some interesting news that is coming out now about uh, what may possibly, what we might see in the upcoming films. Now we saw something in the new trailer that a lot of people are kind of focusing in on and trying to decide, you How know- How can you not focus in on this? It's <laughs> Fast Night in Space! Listen, space! I was like, are I don't they know, going I'm ready to to, I'm ready to watch like a freaking char Dodge Charger, like, drive off the moon and ride on a space shuttle or some sort of craziness like i mean like personally for me i am not a huge fast and the furious fan like i don't really care for the movies too much um but i'm not gonna lie i'll sit in not in the theater i won't pay for it but like if it's on tv or like i can watch it on hbo or something i'll tune in and and watch the nonsense because it is very funny to like see some of the things that they they are able to like do in those movies but um i just think it's just nonsense and i think people just watch it for good fun i don't think anybody really takes these stories like or like the narrative of like the fast movies very seriously i think it's just like oh we want to go watch like senseless action and watch cars do like a yeah. bunch of ridiculous shit that's like not even possible <laughs> <laughs> just, you're just drooling by the end of it. You're, but look, we know they're going into space. Look at Luda and Tyrese. Look at them. They're <laughs> in space about, suits. Like this they're right here. in a car that came <laughs> off of a plane and hits booster rockets. They're going into space. By, by the way, here's what I love about this particular shot. So Tyrese looks like he's like really like angry and upset. Ludacris is like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, he's got that look on his face like, are we really going to do this? I, I think that is kind of, that pretty much encapsulates the entire Fast franchise at this point. Are you sure and a he's little, not and channeling? And a little, and a little. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, are you sure he's not channeling his anger from not getting his own standalone film? <laughs> like the oh. <laughs> They've got time. They've got time. 
Well, uh, <laughs> no, but it's, it's, funny you say, the, it's funny you say that because there have been some interesting quotes that have come out, not only about the idea of them going into space and things like that, but now they're saying there's a possibility that maybe time travel could work its way into the story. I listen. I think Jasmine summed it up earlier where, you know, like she said, she wasn't a fan, but these movies are fun and kind of just like a check your brain at the door. Mm -hmm. I've kind of gotten to a point now where I go to see these films. It's I always think it's funny that they do press screenings for these films because what is the press, <laughs> press going to say? Oh my God, it had all the inspiration of a David Lean epic. Like, what are they going to say about a Fast and the Furious, especially the ninth Fast and beautiful the Furious? Cars, beautiful yeah. cars, beautiful cars. The car beautiful C G cars. <laughs> I back in my day, I remember when the Fast and the Furious was a movie about racing. <laughs> it was not international global conspiracies. It was not. Uh, it, it wasn't John Cena as the hidden brother of, uh, of Dom, and oh my god. Well, I'm sure so, the movies will always be loads better than the game ever was, because they re if you didn't know, they recently had a Fast and the Furious game that came out. Um, it was not good. <laughs> Jasmine, Jasmine, I didn't realize there was a Fast and the Furious animated series, and it's going into, like, what, season five or something? Wait. Like, it's been on... For Wait, like what? <laughs> Did you not? I didn't. I didn't know this either. But apparently, there's an I'm animated. I'm looking this up right now. <laughs> there's an animated series that is on that has been on for multiple seasons, and I didn't know about it. Oh and and just God. recently, he brought it up to me, and I was like, "Oh my God, are you serious?" Look, if if, if you so, yeah, if this, you can't, this if you can't make a, a, a movie with Jason Statham and The Rock trading punches across continents, work then why would you bother? But uh, to go back to your uh, question about critic screenings and critic-proof movies, do you remember when we had to sit through the screening for Jack and Jill? I will never let the studio live this down because they put us in, and, and Jazzy, I don't know if you were in the, the screening for this or not. I was they not, put us, thank goodness. <laughs> oh my God. It was the biggest theater. So uh, North Park is an AMC theater. It's in, it's in central Dallas in a very high tone. They put us in their biggest house and they put the two rows of critics so far in the middle of this massive theater that to get out, you would have had to have crawled your way across at least 12 other people, let alone the critics that you had, you were stuffed in there with. And then we, and then the worst part of it is we had to watch Jack and Jill. I'm yeah. telling you, it was just, I mean, and, I and think, why do you I have a critic they, at that screening? What are they going to say? They, oh, Adam Sandler puts in a tour de force performance as his own twin sister. Sweet bleeding Jesus. I, I think they did that on purpose because they knew that if we wanted to leave, it would take us 30 minutes just to get out of the aisle that we were on because there were so many people there. I don't remember who it was, but I had a friend of mine that was at that screening with me, and I do remember them whispering in my ear, like saying, "Why did you bring me to this?" And and oh I was like, God. I didn't know, I didn't know it was going to be well. Like I, I think we knew it was going to be bad, but I didn't know it was going to be that bad. So which of so which which one of you was Luda, and which one of you was Tyrese in in this picture? <laughs> oh my God. I think we were all ludicrous in this. <laughs> Screening, so at that point, but yeah, oh my Very god, I hope, they, I hope they do go to space. I hope they have a race on the moon. I actually, I think <laughs> the perfect, the perfect ending to Fast and the Furious would be they somehow stole away on the Mars trip where they <laughs> oh my astronauts from Mars, and they have a race on Mars to turn back time. That's the Bruh, perfect, oh. <laughs> perfect ending to the Fast and the Furious franchise. Wow. That would be very interesting to watch. I'm not even going to lie. Like, Hang I would on. probably watch that. <laughs> oh, my God. I just realized something. What? Remember, Fast and the Furious is a Fox property. And Fox still, you know, no, kind of not, whatever. No, it's, it's universal. It's universal? It? Oh, yeah, it yeah, is it's universal. universal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, damn it. Because I was... Okay. Wait a minute. You know what else is universal? Back to the Future. That's right. That's absolutely crossover. Right. They haven't had a DeLorean <laughs> in Fast and the Furious yet, and they, they have not. <laughs> I Notice sense I a crossover said, yeah. happening. I sense yeah. a crossover in our futures. 
<laughs> oh my god. They pop open the door and it's Christopher Lloyd like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Great Scott! How did you get in here? Why is that mouth breather driving? <laughs> oh my god. We were talking oh about my. Godzilla earlier. Uh, Devin, you got a little something on that. Well, yeah, because I am a massive, I, I'm a massive Godzilla fan, as everybody knows. And I was a little perturbed in the lack of Godzilla that we had in a film called Godzilla vs. Kong. So, at least I'm going to be able to get my Godzilla fix when Netflix comes out with a ser an animated series from Japan called Godzilla Singular Point. We don't know a lot about the series as of yet. We don't even know if it's going to be subtitled or if it's going to be um, English dubbed for American audiences, but we do know that we're getting a full series with the big green guy in June of 2021. So we got our first look at what Godzilla is going to look like. We've got the rendering here, and it's going to be a mix of traditional 2D animation and 3D computer animation. I cannot wait to see this because I have eaten up... I, I loved Shin Gajira. I loved everything with the exception of the uh, Emmerich and Devlin... Uh, 1999 Godzilla, with, yeah, because I, I thought Matthew Broderick was really miscast as Godzilla. I didn't think he worked very well in it. So the bottom, really, I'm not going to get one snicker out of either of you guys for that. I, I, I don't disagree at I all. I mean, right? Yeah, I was just like, don't movie. really disagree. <laughs> I didn't think, but, oh, never mind. That, the, was, you, 19, that the, was 1998, by the way, not 99. I thought it came out, oh, no, it's because the marketing campaign, because there, there's show. a... There was, was a jostle years, back and forth between us. Uh, it was two years after Independence Day. Right, but so it was know, a jostling so back and forth. I love for that movie because it was ridiculous. <laughs> mm -hmm. So which is more ridiculous, Fast 8 or um, uh, 98 Godzilla? Oh my God, Fast and the Furious well, yeah. Godzilla. That's what I want to see <laughs> right there. Right there, driving the cars up the back as he's like doing the like <laughs> nuclear blast thing is like powering up. That's what I want to see right there. <laughs> Well, can't do it. It's Warner Brothers. Sorry. By the way, I, I, this this image that you posted here, I can't help but notice in the background. If you look at the Godzilla head, it kind of looks like when you see the, you know, the Japanese parades with the giant dragon heads. It kind of reminds me of that. Yeah, I, I like that mm -hmm. a lot. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And and when is this going to hit? So um, they haven't given us the exact date. Uh, the trailer just hit um, from Netflix. It'll be on American. Uh, Netflix on June of 2021. So at least uh, right. some point in the next six weeks or so, we'll see our. And it's an ep ep it's episodic, and they're going to dump the whole thing like Netflix always does. So I'll, I'll be I'll like be out lettuce. for a weekend. The scales look like lettuce on that art. <laughs> the back scales. I'm like I just think of lettuce when I look at that. But anyway, <laughs> that's like the most random thing I have to say. <laughs> Maybe Godzilla was in a kale bed when the, like, when the atomic bomb went off. Right, bonsai, like, bonsai trees on his back. Some rhubarb, like you know, whatever you want. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, uh, we talked about Zack Snyder earlier, and Jasmine also mentioned Game of Thrones, so I guess that helps lead us into our final news story of the show, and that is, for those of you that were curious as to whether or not we were going to get a sequel to right, when you Man, the news. Oh, no! Uh, <laughs> because, I, you know, I mean, everybody's kind of curious, like, what's going on with the DC Warner Brothers Cinematic Universe? Are there going to be more DC movie sequels? I mean, we've been hearing that there's going to be a Flash movie. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But the one thing I think a lot of people were curious about was Aquaman 2 because... They just canceled their plans for doing a the Trench spinoff movie that they were going to do. Well, now we know that not only is Aquaman 2 officially going to be coming, Jason Momoa is back in the lead role, but they have added in Game of Thrones alumni, Pilu Asbiak, who I happen to think is phenomenal. I had a wonderful chance to meet him and hang out with him at the Overlord uh, premiere at Fantastic Fest a couple years ago. This guy is so cool. I'm so happy that he's getting uh, to be in this. Uh, I'm trying to think. I just we, what did we just see him pop up in? There was some movie he was in where uh, he plays a bad guy, uh, but it's like a really brief role. I mean, I, and I'm not thinking of Overlord. It was a different film, but yeah, he's going to be joining Aquaman too. Um, although I don't think there's been any kind of official announcement 
uh, other than the fact that it's just expected he's playing a villain. That's all we know. Yeah, about. and haven't they already, they've already started filming too. I know Jason Momoa was like posting stuff on his Instagram, like. Yeah, production has started, but I don't I don't know if they've officially started filming, but I know they are <laughs> pre-production on it and that it's it's probably gonna start, I would assume they're gonna start directing any, any minute now. Uh, James Wan is directing once again, so it's mm -hmm. good news about that. And producer Peter Sar Safran. Uh, and so, yeah, we don't really know much about the plot. Uh, we don't really know much of anything about it other than the fact that now we at least know who one of the uh, added in stars of the film is. So that's kind of uh, cool. Ghost in the Shell was the flick that you were thinking about, I, I'm, I'm thinking, because he doesn't have a lot of English uh, credits. So he was he was opposite Scarlett Johansson in Lucy. He mm -hmm. um, was in the remake of Ben-Hur. Okay. Which I don't think any of us saw, and then uh, about two and Ghost in the Shell. No, uh, okay. I know what I know what it was. It was uh, oddly enough, it was not. This is the reason why I couldn't think of it. It was a film I saw on streaming, and it was called Outside the Wire with Anthony Mackie. He plays uh, 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 the bad guy in that film, but it's a very brief role. But that was something I just saw him in. And I think that just hit, what was it, Netflix, like about six months ago or so. That's an interesting film, by the way, if you've never seen it. It's a, it, Outside the Wire. Um, uh, Anthony Mackie plays like a, a cybernetic attack soldier. And uh, it's a really interesting, it's a movie that I don't think hardly anyone saw. But he's in there. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I, I like that guy a lot. So I'm excited to see what he does in Aquaman too. Yeah. Did you, All right. did you guys like Aquaman? I, I thought it was fun for what it was. It was fun, um, but I didn't like love it. I know a lot yeah. of people really loved it, um, but it, it was all right for me. Um, I'm just happy that it's getting a sequel. I think Jason Momoa deserves it. Um, and it's really nice to see, you know, a person of color in a lead role uh, having a successful film. So I'll always support that. So, mm -hmm. you know, good on him and everything that he's doing. Um, I'll go watch it, but like, I'm not like a huge fan of, of the Aquaman film. I can't remember <laughs> who did the score for it, but whoever they got, it made me insane because <laughs> every single cue was a bomb, bomb, bomb. And that just pulled me. It, it's colorful, it's bright, it's fun. I loved seeing Tim Morrison as as uh, Arthur Curry's uh, human father. The, it, it, the composer was R Rupert Gregson Williams, who studied under Hans Zimmer. He was in that whole Hans Zimmer. Well, uh, he must have missed the he missed the he missed the class that Hans gave <laughs> on varying up the musical cues because I think he was I, I that was definitely missing from that flick. Yeah, I don't know. I think I just checked out when they started playing the Pitbull remix of Toto from Africa, and I was like, "Wait, what is happening?" <laughs> because we've got to have a pop music. Uh, we've, we've got to have a pop music hook because the, the kids way, aren't going to watch it otherwise. Devin, please thank Kieran for us for covering up your doppelganger. You <laughs> don't want to see that anymore. No, 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 no. He got some purring ASMR too stay earlier. Right there. By the way, on the next show, I want you to wear that shirt so that there will be two of you wearing the yeah, same shirt. Yeah, please do. So. I wore that shirt to opening day, and I was sad that I couldn't bring uh, my doppel with me. They wouldn't let me bring it in. All right, uh, so um, finally, I wanted to uh, go ahead and use our last minutes here to roll out something that I've wanted to do since the minute that I could actually um, put stuff online, and that is the Big Film Show Big Gold Statue Challenge. We are two weeks out from the Oscars. We have our own Oscar pool, and it is incredibly easy to play. All you have to do is go to bigfilmshow.oscars, and um, you will see. And hang you on, you mean bigfilmshow.com forward slash Oscars? Yes. What did I say? You said dot Oscars. <laughs> okay. Well, thankfully, I was smart enough to, to put my own banner in there and understand that there was actually going to be need to be um, a visual cue for you guys to tell me that By I By the way, I get sick and tired of every show having to be like, um, excuse me, I think you missed the <laughs> There it and is. And it's All right, so, Mark, well, no, I'm not going to do it because, um, eh, and I'm not going to ask you to do it because you'll probably crash the damn thing. And by that, I mean your own um, uh, computer. So it's incredibly easy to play. All you have to do is not be the administrator for it. Um, you can go through all 27 categories, 
pick your favorite, you know, pick your favorite for each one, and I'll take you all the way through from best picture, you know, here's actor in supporting role, here is film editing. So, Mark, I'm going to challenge you to go on ahead and hit that ballot, you know, as soon as you possibly can, so yeah, yeah. everybody else can take your picks and compare them to ours. Are we, uh, next week's show, is that the show that we're going to give our picks? Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know we had talked about doing that, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and give a spoiler alert. I think Viola Davis has taken home uh, the Oscar for Best Actress. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's see who I picked for that. And, I uh, went he, with Frances McDormand. Did you really? Uh, I did. I, you know what? I think the, 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 the upset could be uh, Andrew Day. But yeah, uh, uh, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I I'm I think we talked about this before. I'm afraid that United States versus Billy Holiday came in a little bit too late, but uh, I do. It's getting a lot of buzz right now. So if she does end up taking it, I wouldn't be surprised. With but the way I, that I, Viola is trending in terms of awards, though, I oh, foresee yeah. her definitely taking that she's that category. So, oh God, she's so great in that movie. So. Um, and one thing that I did want to let everybody else know is that if you want to do that live Oscar watching thing, our good friends at the Texas Theater are doing a benefit screening of the Oscars. Now, of course, you can't charge to get in for the Oscars, but what you can do is when you get there, you can purchase a ballot and play along in the seats. They're going to have limited capacity there at the theater, and they do follow the cinema safe rules on how to uh, correctly show movies in a safe fashion with the with their HIPAA filters and the rest of that working overtime for it. And we would love for you to not only play our bracket challenge, but then go to the Texas afterwards. Because if you win our bracket challenge and you're there at the Texas, you're going to walk out of there with a massive prize pack from the big film show promotional closet. Yeah, I've got some Blu-rays. Uh, we've got some Invincible prizes, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna put together a really nice prize package for that stuff. So you're you're gonna want to win that. Trust me. And you have to be present at the Texas to take it home. So go well, to the TexasTheater.com. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, hell yeah, I I fly bring over it, there. Bring <laughs> it down here, Jazzy. Seriously, I I, I ain't even lying. Um, so once again, go to the TexasTheater.com for all the details on their uh, big gold statue watching party. IRL, I think, is, is in the uh, title of how they're doing it. So, Jasmine, I want to see your picks on here before too long. Yeah, I will definitely yeah. hop on there and make my predictions for sure. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, there's one other thing that I want to talk about on the scoring. Because they are the hardest categories to pick, we made it a little different because the documentary feature, documentary short subject, foreign language film, short subject live action, and live action animated, all of those are worth double points. Mm -hmm. So if you get those right, that's actually going to be a bonus for you in that front. I'm sorry, and that shouldn't be a live action. In, that should and be it will a, be incredible because we'll know you've never seen them. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> But again, and we've said this over and over again, this is the year that every single person who watches the Oscars will have a chance to see all of, a vast majority of the films right. in their own home. Yeah. Yeah, it really is incredible when you think about it. Like, we've never had an Oscars this where, where the selections were more accessible to just, you know, anybody. I mean, having the opportunity to watch it at home, uh, you really have no excuse now. You can't say, well, I didn't have time to go to the movie theater. All you had to do was turn on the TV. So, you know, now you really have time to watch those. And you've still got two full weeks to watch all of these uh, Oscar nominees. So be sure and pick those out. Uh, real quickly, I left it off from the news. We were going to mention it, and I, I wanted to mention it. A uh, little bit of casting news that I thought was particularly exciting. Uh, we found out last week that Phoebe Waller-Bridge had joined the cast of Indiana Jones 5 and that John Williams was coming back to score at what we assume will be his final film score before he officially retires. Uh, we assume that with Rise of Skywalker, now we assume with this. But today we found out that Mads Mikkelsen, the great Mads Mikkelsen, is also joining the cast of Indiana Jones 5. And I'm betting a little bit of money that he's playing a bad guy. But that's right. me. Uh, so I did want to mention that. And also for anyone that missed it, our show earlier this week, 
not only did we talk about United States versus Billie Holiday, we also talked about the classic Billie Holiday biopic, Lady Sings the Blues. If you guys missed that show, be sure and check that out from earlier this week, uh, because I think you're going to be hearing a lot more about United States versus Billie Holiday in the next couple of weeks. And you can catch all of our shows on whatever podcast delivery you like on Apple, Spotify, any of the rest of them. You can uh, search for Big Film Show there. You can also search for the Big Film Show on our YouTube channel to see our incredibly pasty white mugs, even though I was able to get out and get a little sun. Uh, Mark hasn't. He's he's still uh, incredibly pasty white for that. Yes, search for Big Film Show light on. Up even brighter on my face. <laughs> that is incredibly right. Once again, I do want to remind you to go to the thetexastheater.com for the In Real Life Oscar watching party on Sunday, April the twenty fifth. Jazzy, what does Riot Games have coming up? What 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 what's uh, what's um do, what's uh, dominating your brain right now? Oh geez, I wish I could tell you what Riot Games is coming up. I cannot. Oh, it's a secret. Oh. Uh, yeah, that good old NDA life. Um, <laughs> but in in. Uh, you know, announced information. Our new champion, Gwen, is coming soon. So um, definitely check that out if you like League of Legends. Um, and once again, the game I work on, Team Fight Tactics, we're launching Set 5, Reckoning. Um, so that should be a lot of fun. Check that out. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, anything that's going on with me right now, not much. Hopefully in the future, I'll have some updates or changes once things open back up um but if you want to follow my shenanigans you can follow me at pbn tweets underscore on twitter um that is where i am most active uh talking about film tv and even some game industry commentary so you can check me out there um but other than that thanks for having me I, I enjoyed it. It's an absolute pleasure and if there's anything that is is uh grinding your gears in entertainment you are always welcome to join us here on the Big Film Show. Oh, Absolutely sure. love Look at having that you. Sweet dog. Look at oh that yes, dog. you get dog action here. Yeah, like whenever. Also follow, also follow Pretty Brown and Nerdy on Facebook as well. I oh, know you yes. post a lot of your content on there as well. So um, yeah, we have uh, actually uh, Twitter as well. Uh, Twitch. Um, I stream on Twitch a lot now, okay. so um, you can follow me at Pretty Brown and Nerdy on Twitch. Uh, watch me play games and just chat. Um, I'm always on for the most part. Um, haven't streamed uh, this week or last week so much because uh, had some stuff going on that kept me busy. But that is um, where I am most active at the moment. Awesome. Fantastic. Jasmine, it's um, been so awesome having you on here because we miss you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm always down to chat whenever you have some interesting topics that you think yes. I provide good insight on particularly if you're going to talk about falcon and the winter soldier once it's over yeah, i'm happy yes. to join we want to do that. A, we want to do a wrap-up show and also uh i noticed like because you had posted your review of wonder woman 84 the next time there's like a streaming movie like that that we can all watch let's let's do like a group review on that i think that'd be fun to do oh absolutely yeah. i, I think we should that. do that for mortal kombat Oh, oh my God, that'd you be know perfect. what? Yeah, yes, that. that would be perfect. Yeah, I would join for that. that. <laughs> and that's coming. That's that's a week from Thursday, or it's, mm -hmm. it's it's not even a week from Thursday. It's this coming yeah, it's, Thursday. It's this coming Thursday. Yeah, it'll be yes. out. Okay. So we will do we'll do a uh, a scener, I think is the uh, network that will do it for that, and then we'll have the uh, wrap party. Um, it'll be an extended version of the wrap party. So yeah. definitely take care of that. Follow us on all the social channels. Jasmine, once again, thank you very much for doing it. Kids, that's Jasmine. And that's Mark Walt. No, not, I did it that right. That's Mark. I'm so, <laughs> I'm confuddled. That's Mark Walters. And that's Devin Pike sitting next to a doppelganger picture of Devin Pike that is really creepy. <laughs> we'll see you back on Tuesday with another review episode of The Big Film Show. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. For more information on episodes, subscription links, or where to watch the films discussed on this podcast, please visit our companion site, bigfilmshow.com. All rights reserved by the original rights holders, and the display of any material from previously released works are for the sole purpose of promotion of said works. Want to be a part of the Big Film Show? Great, we want that as well. Send an email to hey at bigfilmshow.com. The Big Film Show is a Bacon Samurai production.